Hey guys, welcome back to PPU Academy. Today we're going to talk about another super flexible weapon tree, and that is the sword tree. We're going to start off with the artifact source. The artifact source consists of the clearing blade, the carving sword, and the gallatin pairs. The artifact branch of the sword tree pretty much covers every type of content in this game. You can use the clearing blade to farm, you can use the carving sword for every type of small scale PvP, and you can use the gallatin pair in ZVZs. In PvE and fame farming, the clearing blade is very similar to a great axe. It's a very good solo dungeon weapon with a lot of little PBAOE skills that can really destroy the mobs in solo dungeons. And there's a lot of different ways to build it. You can build it like a great axe with a scholar cow, stalker jacket, and any kind of leather shoes for refreshing sprint. Or on screen right now, you're seeing me run the clearing blade with a miscolor offhand, uh, guardian helmet, cultist robe, and scholar sandals. And the reason why I'm running this build is just simply because I wanted to put some specs into my artifact robes, my guardian helmet, and my scholar sandals. If I was actually trying to get some better clear time out of this build, I would at least run some leather shoes for a refreshing sprint. When it comes to PvP, the Carving Sword is a great choice for pretty much every type of small scaled PvP from soloing to 5v5s. The only place where it kind of falls short is in 2v2 Hellgates, and in 2v2 Hellgates, more people prefer the Broadsword and we'll talk about that in a moment. In 5v5s, the most standard way to build a carving sword is with Hellion jacket, Stalker hood, and whatever boots you prefer. Now in this clip you'll notice I'm using Inner Rub on my W. Inner Rub is a skill that has a lot of potential damage in it, but it's not the skill of choice for your W when it comes to 5v5s. For 5v5s, you'll want to run something more defensive, so Parry Strike or Iron Will. Parry Strike is probably the better choice, but Iron Will is solid as well, especially if you're running Hellion Jacket with it, and the other team has some kind of uh, purges, like Mage Robes or Heavy Mace, uh, because the, the Iron Will makes you immune to purges, so you get to keep your Hellion Jacket for those survival situations. Now uh, for 2v2 Hellgates, you would actually want to in run Inherub on your W unless you're facing a one-shot comp. If you're facing a healer and a DPS comp, and you're running a healer and a DPS, so a carving sword and a healer basically, uh, the Inherub is a skill that gives you a lot of damage, so when you have uh, three heroic stacks from your Q, and you activate inter Interrupt, you'll get a buff that makes all of your auto attacks hit for 60% harder, which is a lot of damage considering how fast it can auto attack with swords when you have your Q stacked. It's also worth mentioning that since your Carving Sword E shreds the armor of the targets that you hit with it, when you stack up your Q and you land your E, uh, and then you activate your Hellion Jacket, the Hellion Jacket is going to hit harder too because of the Armor Shred. And since the Hellion Jacket heals you for the amount of damage that you do, if you shred their armor first and then Hellion, you'll heal yourself for more as well. Now this 5v5 Carving Sword build can be used in solo play as well, and it can do quite well in outnumbered fights because of the way Hellion Jacket works. Now, personally, I would still prefer to build the Carving Sword with a Guardian Helmet and Cultist Robe for solo play. And that is because the Hellion Jacket, I think in the smaller fights, you know, sometimes it just doesn't quite heal you for that much. Uh, if it's a 1v1 fight, you only have one target to lifesteal off of, and it just doesn't heal you that much. And if it's a like a really outnumbered fight, you might not be able to really like stay in the fight for a kill. Um, so if you are trying to disengage and reset, 
well, you can't really do that with a Hellion jacket because the Hellion jacket doesn't heal you unless you're on top of people. Which also makes it harder for you to fight people using ranged kiting weapons like Warbow or Fire Staff with a firewall. Uh, if they just, you know, kite you and stay away from you while you're using Hellion jacket, then you really can benefit from the Hellion jacket. Right, so I would still prefer the cultist robe for getting those resets, and of course when you're wearing a cloth chest piece, you'll do a lot more damage with your weapon skills. So you can go go for more of this like burst and reset kind of playstyle. So you can you know burst someone down and then run away for a reset and then come back and burst someone else down. Uh, if you can't quite afford the cultist robe, uh, of course you can switch that out for a mage robe or a uh, assassin jacket. Uh, the assassin jacket build, guardian helmet, assassin jacket, and demon boots uh, is something that's pretty popular. You see a lot of people running it and mostly this is because of uh, another content creator called eCourts. I'm gonna link his channel in the video description below. Uh, he runs that build a lot and uh, for the most part though like the assassin jacket is it's from what I can tell, it's only like really useful one in uh, solo dungeons when you can use the stealth to take advantage of the mob aggro mechanic. Um, but anyway, I will link his channel and you can go take a look at how he plays that build. We're gonna move on now to talk about the Galatin Pairs. The Galatin Pairs is the best sword for ZVZs. Uh, Galatin pairs are capable of just deleting people. If you have your stacks built and your damage buffs built, you can literally just delete half a Zerg by yourself. There's several different ways to build for the Galatin clap, but the most common ones now are probably Royal Hood with Cleric Robe and Mage Sandals. The idea with this build is, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You get your stacks built, and then you turn on your royal hood, and you hit your mage sandals, and then while your delay teleport is kind of channeling, you hit your E, and you're gonna teleport into the enemy backline and just delete them. Now, of course, it sounds straightforward, but when you're actually trying to execute it, it's not that easy because you know you're in a ZVZ. There's like dozens of people, if not hundreds of people trying to kill you. Uh, so actually getting the clap off can take some skill. And it's definitely harder to run this build than to just run a ranged DPS that will have the same kind of clapping power. Uh, I would say that you know even if you're a pretty good ZVZ player, uh, you'll probably still die more on the Galatine pair than if you were to just run a Wailing Blow. But the Galatine pair just looks super cool when you get the clap off. Now, unfortunately, as a mostly solo player, I don't have that many footages of me playing the Galatin pair. So I'm gonna, uh, again, link somebody else's channel in the descriptions. And you can go look at how they played the Galatin pair and how the build works in the ZVZ. Okay, we're gonna move on now to talk about the Broadsword. The Broadsword is actually my favorite sword to use. And it's a it's by far the strongest sword in 2v2 Hellgates. Compared to other swords, the Brass Sword E doesn't quite do that much damage, but being a one-hand weapon means you can run a offhand with it. So if you run a Moisek in your offhand, you're actually not really sacrificing any damage at all. And the biggest advantage of the Brass Sword is that uh, your E has a 10 second cooldown without omelets. It's probably like the shortest cooldown E that can do so much single target damage and have a lot of utilities in it. It's a gap closer, it's an interrupt, and also gives you a little bit of an armor buff. So it's a really solid skill. And being on such a short cooldown means that you can spam it. So in 2v2 Hellgaze where you're running a broadsword with a healer, um, you're basically the only damage on your team, so you be, so being able to spam your E just to create pressure uh, is really strong. Like you don't have to save the E just for an execute, you can use it to create pressure, right? Because it'll just be up again 10 seconds later. 
And if you do manage to pressure someone to below half health without using your E, you can hit your stalker hood and then immediately follow up with the E. And on any cloth target, that's like a guaranteed kill. So to build for 2v2 Hellgaze with the broadsword, I would use Fiend Robe, Stalker Hood, and some kind of boots, some kind of defensive boots, probably Guardian Boots. And I will keep a Cultist Sandal in my pocket. So if I get to build check the other team and I make sure they're not running some kind of one-shot build, uh, then I can switch to the Cultist Sandal, which is better against uh, healer DPS comps. Uh, for your W skill, in 2v2 Hellgaze, I will run Parry Strike by default, and after you build check and you make sure they're not running one-shot builds, you can switch to Interrupt for more pressure. Next, we're going to talk about the Claymore. The Claymore is very similar to the Brassword, whether E do are basically the same thing with slight variations. The Claymore E is an actual stun, not just the interrupt. It's a very short duration stun, but it is a stun. And the biggest upside though is that the range on the Claymore E is like huge. Like it takes you across the map kind of huge. And um, it's also non interrupt though, so you can charge through stuff like wind walls and firewalls with it. However, the Claymore E is a 20 second cooldown instead of a 10 second cooldown. And since you lose the access to the Moisek offhand, you're not really getting that much more damage out of the Claymore E compared to the Broadsword. So in 2v2 Hellgates, it's definitely not the preferred sword. Uh, however, a lot of people do run the Claymore in 5v5s because of its ability to like really execute people without being interrupted. So that's a reason to run the Claymore. Okay, next we're going to talk about the last weapon in the sword tree, which is the dual swords. The dual swords were actually like the kind of like the meta or the go-to weapon for solo play. I would say about like five, maybe four or five months ago, uh, but the carving sword kind of took over that. In solo play, the Carving Sword and the Dual Swords have really similar playstyles. They both have a E that's on a 20 second cooldown. That's a um, non-targeted leap, so you can use it for both escape and for engage. Their E skills also do, I would say, like pretty similar amounts of damage. Uh, but the biggest downside for the Dual Swords is actually the shape of the AoE. It's a circle shape at the end of the AoE as opposed to a line shape. So with the line shaped dash skills, uh, like the you know the, the carving sword E or the spear E, uh, the advantage to them is that if you're standing right next to someone, you can dash in any direction and it'll hit them. So for example, if a group of people is chasing you and when they catch up to you, while you dash away from them, you can also hit them for some damage. So that gives you a little bit of a kiting effect, if you will. You can grind them low while you're kind of like keeping your distance. But with any of the skills that does an AoE damage at the end of a leap, for example, the bear paws, or in this case, the dual swords, uh, then you don't really have that option. You can only either disengage with it or do damage with it. You can do both. So that's probably the reason why you you really don't see that many dual swords anymore. Most of the solo players using swords now are carving sword players. Um, but you know the the dual swords is a non artifact weapon. It's a lot easier to level up, and it's a lot cheaper than the carving sword. So if you see people running dual swords in the open world, it's probably for those reasons. Now the dual sword actually have another good use for them is in 5v5s. Um, in 5v5s, a lot of the times you'll see people running something cheesy like a double healer with triple bruisers. And in comps like that, they'll have a carving sword and then two other melee weapons. And if you already have a carving sword on your team and you want to run another sword, then the dual sword is one of the weapons that you can really look at. The dual sword E in 5v5 is actually pretty devastating. Uh, the damage that you do with it is partially true damage, so it's also very, very good for killing tanks. 
And of course, it's got a pretty decently sized AOE to it, so you can't really clap a whole team with it if they clump up for you. So that's it for our quick overview of the sword tree. Again, the artifact branch of the tree pretty much covers every type of content in this game. So if you want to spec into some source, I do recommend that you start with the artifact. Even though the artifact takes a long time to spec up, uh, once you get it there, it's like you're pretty set. You can use the carving sword for pretty much everything. And then the galatines for ZVZs and um, the clarin blade for solo farming dungeons. Right, so you're going to be really in a good spot if you just level up the artifact tree. And then if you want to put some attention into 2v2 Hellgates, you, know, you can uh, spec up your broadsword as well. And then after that, if you want to get the 400, you can slowly spec up the other two sword branches. So that's it for this video. If you have any more questions, throw in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. Remember to like and subscribe. And if you want to just hang out and have a good time together, remember to join us on my Twitch at twitch.tv slash lbmpupu. I'll see you there.